And this afternoon, we're going to talk about accessible tables in Word and simplifying complex tables. And then we'll also talk about remediating uh, tables in PDF using Adobe Acrobat Pro DC. All right, so I'm going to start this off here. Let me go ahead and share my desktop. Great. Oops. There we go. All right. So uh, again, my name is Gaby DeYoung, and I am a member of the IT accessibility team, and I'll be talking about um, creating accessible tables in Word and simplifying complex tables. And uh, later on with me is going to be Andrew Michaels. He's a student assistant with UWIT, and um, I'll have him introduce himself in a little bit. Uh, and he's going to talk more about um, remediating tables using Adobe Acrobat Pro. Okay. So guidelines for formatting tables in Word. So for tables, uh, by default, assistive technology reads the table from left to right and then from top to bottom. And if that relationship between the cells is not defined and the, and the header, then the table is not formatted accurately. So if heading cells aren't associated with those data cells, a user can get lost in a sea of data. So the first guideline uh, when using tables is to not use tables for layout. They should really only be used to display data. And the reason for this is uh, because it creates accessibility barriers. Um, some examples of that are um, uh, for users of assistive technology or screen reader users, when they encounter a table, they usually need to adjust their equipment to read in what is called tables mode to access the content. And this makes navigating a table while consuming the information um, a bit more challenging. And also when you're creating a table, authors can assign a header row to the table, and you should, and we'll talk a little bit more about that and go through those steps. But authors cannot include headings in a table used for layout. So remember that headings are a critical part for providing structural outline of content. So any paragraph styling for text um, is also used as navigation, cannot be included in a table cell. Uh, you can format the table, but uh, the, uh, the paragraph styles cannot be included within those, those table cells. Another example is um, if the document is converted to a tagged PDF, the table structure is also converted and remediation is going to be necessary to re-tag that table and apply the proper semantic structure. So everything is going to need to be pulled out of that table and then re-tagged as a, a proper uh, heading level or a proper paragraph or list, uh, whatever happens uh, it happens to be in. And then al alternatively, if the, the document is con uh, converted to Braille rather, the document will be in Braille table format, and that will need to be remediated to move the table structure as well. So those last two items really are um, time consuming and really can be kind of a, a cost uh, barrier as well um, to accessible content. So uh, really uh, do not uh, really frown upon using tables for layout. Now, simple tables, simple data tables can be made accessible in Word for Windows. Uh, but complex tables um, cannot, uh, and they really should be simplified for clarity. So if you have a table that is nested within a table, this can be, again, really confusing to uh, screen reader users um, as it becomes a maze while trying to figure out the navigational coordinates while also trying to access the content. And then we're also going to go over the difference between table design and table layout in, uh, in Word as well. So table layout, uh, the table layout tab in Word. So to create a table in Word, authors go to the insert tab on the home ribbon, and there they'll, they'll see a table icon with the drop down menu. Um, and if they click on that drop down menu, they'll get a table gallery and there they can draw or they can create their table by selecting the number of rows and columns and then that will insert the table into the document. There's also an option to draw a table, but um, 
We recommend not doing that as this does not include the same level of table reading and navigation commands that are necessary that are needed by assistive technology users. And it's also just a really weird tool to use and it isn't very user friendly. Table design affects the look and feel of the table in Word, and it also allows for customization of table formatting. So to access the table design tab, you'll need to highlight the table first. And this is going to add two new tabs to the home ribbon. There are the table design and layout tabs. And on the table design tab, by default, the checkboxes for header row, first column and banded rows are automatically checked, just like we see here on the image on this particular slide. And usually leaving these check boxes alone and using the default settings when creating a table in Word is fine for accessibility. So the checkbox for header row um, just denotes that the first row of the table that contains headers that help identify the contents of a particular column. And for accessibility, data tables, they have to have that header row to provide contextual structure. And this helps AT users when they're navigating within that table. Uh, usually the first column of that's checked that contains row headings. And this can remain checked even if the first column does not include any row headings. Banded rows and banded columns alternate the background color of rows and columns, but it's important to note that if you choose certain table style options, they may have a different effect depending upon the table style you choose. So be aware that um, selecting a predefined color combo from the gallery that can affect uh, the header row of the table. Um, so you want to make sure to, to check that if you're going to do any banded rows or columns or any coloring within your table. Make sure that you, um, you check and make sure that your table header is, is going to be accurate and we'll go over that in a second. Total row is the last row of the table and if this option is selected that means that the last row will be formatted differently from the body rows and it's designed to summarize the rows above it. And last column applies to special formatting to the column to summarize earlier columns. Okay, the layout tab in Word includes commands for changing the entire table format and changing the appearance of individual table components such as cells and columns and rows. And the layout tab also includes access to the table properties options, and this affects the functionality of the table. The table properties is where authors assign the header row of a table and also where authors can include a table summary, which is really helpful for screen reader users as well. So normally to assign a header row of a table, the user would select the table and then select the layout tab from the ribbon and then select the properties icon and that will launch the table properties dialog window and in the table properties dialog window you want to select the row tab and this is the image that we see here on the slide this is the, the table properties dialog window with the row tab exposed now, by default, um, I have the options uh, section on that table properties window um, enclosed in a, in a red rectangle. And by default, those che the checkbox option for repeat as header row at the top of each page is not selected. So what you want to do is you want to select that check mark and that, in that box, and that's going to assign the top row of your table as the header row and it just defines the relationship between the header and the corresponding data. You also want to make sure to uncheck the box that says allow row to break across pages. A good table really should not contain a data cell that spans more than one page. So um, unchecking that box will, will force it to stay within that one page. Continue. So essentially you want to mimic what we see here on that slide. You want to uncheck allow rows to break across, across pages and then check the box that says repeat header row at the top of each page. Now, if you want to include a table summary, which is very helpful and assists assistive technology users by uh, providing meaningful information about the table, within this table properties box, you select the alt text tab, yeah. and then you can enter in a short description of the table in the description field. 
There's also a title field under that alt text um, option, but you want to leave the title uh, field blank and just uh, include the, the information about the data table uh, in the description field. Okay, um, so steps for simplifying complex tables in Word. You always want to keep a table's title out of the table itself. Uh, that way, an assistive technology user can read the subject of the table before deciding whether they want to go to the trouble to read the data inside. And this also provides a way for a user to scan through the document faster um, as, uh, uh, while using uh, heading levels to, uh, to determine where they are within the document. Uh, number two, you want to make sure that it's keyboard accessible. You can place your cursor in the first table cell and then use the tab key to emulate what it's like for a screen reader that would move through the table. Does the, does the cursor move in a logical manner? And does that flow make sense? Step three, is the text legible? If you're using banded color, uh, you want to make sure to double check uh, the background and uh, make sure that the text in the background have an appropriate level of contrast. And you want to make sure that you define the header row. Is the header cell text visually different than the data cells? Um, and then step five, assistive technology does not understand empty, split, or merged cells. So when making calculations, uh, to get to the user, which can be confusing. So you really should avoid empty cells, merged cells, or split cells. Okay, so I'm going to provide a demonstration here in Word, and you want to make sure that when you're creating tables in Word that you're using the desktop client. The online version of Word can't create accessible tables as there's no way to view the table's property, table properties options, and define the table header. So it's really important that if you're creating Word documents that have table, um, tables in there, that you're including, um, uh, or that you're creating it from, uh, uh, from the desktop client. Okay. So here we have our uh, document or, or that we use um, for uh, demonstration purposes. This is our regular document here. And you'll notice that I have uh, my regular table, a, a very simple table here. It has three columns and eight rows. So um, nothing too, um, too difficult about this. And again, just for review, in order to create a table, you would simply go to the Insert tab, and then from the Table drop-down menu, here's your gallery, and then you can just start drawing your table. Pretty simple. It inserts it there. Um, I want to review with you guys uh, the, uh, the um, uh, assigning that top row as your header row. And again, to do that, you would select the table. And when you do that, I wanna do this again. I wanna show you here um, up in the, the ribbon here, when I select that table, there's gonna be a couple of different options that show up. So I've got table design, and this is where those check boxes are located. Then I have these banded row options, and I can choose colors if I want to. I'm not going to in this particular case. Um, and then if I go to the layout tab, which is also, uh, also appears when you select the, uh, the table um, itself, you'll notice here that I have this properties icon. And if I click on that, that's gonna open up the table properties dialog box. And I can click on this row tab. And again, this is the default setting. So the options are, um, uh, the, the, the options for this are the first checkbox says allow row to break across pages. You want to uncheck that. Again, a, a good table cell should not span more than one page. And then you want to check the, the second checkbox that it says repeat header row at the top of each page. And that's going to automatically turn that top row into your header row. If I go to the alt text tab, um, I can enter in a description here. And this will be simple table with three columns and 
eight rows. And that gives information to assistive technology users about this particular table and informs them that this is a simple table and it's pretty easy to navigate. Okay, so no problems with this uh, particular uh, table. We're going to scroll down here and take a look at this other table here. So down here I have a more complex table. I've got merged cells um, and I have my heading in my table um, and I've got all things, all kinds of different things going on here. I also wanted to point out down at the bottom here of my Word window, I have, excuse me, I have this little indicator here that says accessibility recommendations found. Click here to investigate. So I'm going to go ahead and click there and see what it says. So I've got some accessibility warnings and they are specific to this table. And it says that there are merge or split cells in the table. Now, if I select that particular warning, it's going to tell me exactly where in the table in this document where, uh, where that warning is. And then it's going to give me some information as to um, you know, why this is an issue. So why should I fix this? And it says here, tables should have simple structure so that they can be easily navigated and understood by people with disabilities. Merge or split cells can cause unexpected navigation issues. And then it says steps to, uh, steps to fix. Test and simplify the table structure. Select the first cell and then press the tab key repeatedly to make sure that, move, that focus moves across the rows and then down to the next row. And then the third step here is change cells that are merged or split cells as needed by selecting merge cells or split cells button from the table layout tab. So I'm going to go ahead and check uh, what it would be like for an assistive technology device or screen reader, how, how it would um, interact with this particular table just by pressing the tab key. So first of all, I'm in the top section, uh, the top row there where it says grades. Try that again. Okay, and then from grades, it takes me to homework. And then from there, it goes to exams and then projects. And then it goes back to homework. And then it goes to uh, the, that second column there with the number one. And then the third column with the number two and then final. And then what is that? The fifth column or sixth column with the number one, seventh column with number two, and then eighth column with the word final. And then it announces 15%, 15%, 15%, 20%, 10%, 10%, 15%. Now, it's important to note when using JAWS or a screen reader on a table like this, um, it will announce right from the get-go that this is a non-uniform table. So it informs the screen reader user that this table is not a simple table, that there are merged cells and indicates that, okay, I need to do some, some navigating around in these cells and kind of get the relationship to the different words and, and, and how they are associated within this table. So in, in this particular case, the user might go back and forth several times to try to figure out, you know, is this uh, exam, uh, is this uh, for, uh, uh, exam one or project one, and then is uh, is that fifteen percent um, a grade for homework, or uh, for exam one or for exam two? It's really difficult to tell um, when uh, when you have all these different merged cells that are happening in this particular case. So how would we simplify this table? I'm going to scroll down here and give a couple of different examples. So first of all, I definitely want to take out um, the, the table header. In this case, this is great. So I'm going to take that out of the table and I'm actually going to assign that as a heading um, instead of a table header. And then you can also kind of visually see how these particular tables would be chunked out. Um, and so I've kind of given a, 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 a a diagram or, or uh, a chunked out version of uh, that particular table and it chunks out very nicely into three different tables. But I can see here that I've still got this uh, for exams and projects, I still have some merged cells here and that's still going to cause some problems for screen reader and assistive technologies. So I've got a more 
simplified version down here. I still have grades um, as a heading level two. And then I've taken um, these headings out and I've signed those as a heading level three. So I've got homework, but then I have uh, this 15% in its own table cell there, which isn't horrible, but it's a little odd. Um, and then I have exams as a heading level three. And then I have a very simple table here that I can assign uh, my header row to uh, this top rows as well as this top row and for, for exams and projects. So that simplifies it even more, but maybe it doesn't look all that great. So I've got a third option here. So in this case, I'm not using any tables at all. What I've done is I'm actually using the columns um, option. So I can show you this uh, by turning on the non printing characters or the show hide option for the non-printing characters. And I can see here that this is a section break. I want to highlight this. And then if I go to insert, uh, gosh, where is it? I'm sorry, it's in the, under layout. And then I go to columns. I can see here that I've um, turned this into a three column layout, which is more visually pleasing and kind of mimics the original table itself. But in this case, I'm not using a table at all. I've just turned that, uh, I've just um, written out some text and then I've turned it into a three column, um, a three column um, item there where I have homework separated from exams and separated from projects. And um, a screen reader user is going to be able to navigate to each one of these items very easily because I've created heading levels for, for each one of these items here. So uh, again, grades is heading level two, homework exams and projects heading level three. So really easy to navigate to those areas. Um, and then the screen reader will read it in successive order from there. Um, so that's pretty much it um, for creating or for simplifying rather more complex tables um, in Microsoft Word. Um, and I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to stop sharing. Oops, don't want to do that. I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm going to hand it over to Andrew. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Andrew and I'm going to be going over the table editing methods in Adobe Acrobat DC now. But first a little bit about me. Um, I'm a third year at UW in the informatics program and I've been working as the accessibility student assistant for around a year now. And a little bit about what I do is I work with Adobe Acrobat and I remediate online documentation so that the structure of, of the document as well as the tag structure is in a better way that a uh, screen reader can go through the document correctly. But now I'm gonna go ahead and get into the table editing methods. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is the table editor. And the table editor uh, allows us to visualize the table structure and data cells of more simple tables. And it also allows us to define each column header or row header and the span of these column or row headers for either one or many cells. And I'll show a few examples of this in the demo soon. But the table editor can also be um, accessed through the reading order panel of the accessibility tools in Acrobat. And um, the nice thing about the uh, table editor and table cell properties is that we're offered a really uh, user-friendly UI that allows us to define the scope of different column and row headers, as well as the row span. And the second method I'm going to be talking about is the edit attribute objects function. And um, this function allows us to create more complex table structures rather than the simple ones that would be represented by the table editor. And it's also much safer to use this function rather than the table editor, as um, if you mess up defining the span of a column header using the table editor, that can result in a malformed table. And many times this would result in needing to roll back the document to a previous save to get that table structure back correctly. However, I would say the one drawback of using this method is that it's 
Uh, it's definitely a little bit slower as we would need to define the scope and span of data cells manually for each cell. And then again, the edit attribute object functions can be found through the properties menu of each tag. And once we select the edit attribute object function, you'll be offered a, uh, a menu to manually put in the column span as well as the columns, uh, as well as the scope of each header. And then just before going into the demo, I'm just gonna talk about uh, my own general workflow when I'm working with tables in Acrobat. The first thing I usually do is just try to determine how complex the table is using the table editor. And if I see some malformed data cells, then I'll go on to step two and bring out the edit attribute objects feature, which will allow me to edit more complex tables. And um, while going through the tables, the first thing I always do is make sure that I remediate the column and row headers first. That way I know um, how the content within a table aligns under each column or row header. And then the fourth thing I do is I make sure that I place the content in the table directly with me, directly underneath each table cell. And as we'll see in the demo that I'm about to show, sometimes Acrobat adds extra tags within tables, such as paragraph tags that we'll need to get rid of. And then the last step I have here is just um, a double check, but just making sure that all the header and data cells are tagged correctly and placed in the correct table row, just to ensure that the table structure is tagged correctly. And just a brief overview of the demo, I'll be using the table editor to um, demo on a more uh, simple table structure. And then I'll also be using the edit attribute object feature uh, on remediating a more complex table structure. So I'm gonna go ahead and change my screen to Acrobat. Here I have the, uh, the physics core syllabus um, in PDF form now. And I'm gonna go ahead and start by remediating this first table here, which is the class schedule. Um, but before I get into the table editor or the edit attribute um, function, I'm gonna, I just wanna make sure that we all understand the tag structure. And this table can be found in the tags pane, which is represented by this icon on the left. And clicking it, we'll be able to see all the tags in this document. And it'll be under this first table tag here, which highlights all the tags within this class scheduled table. And if we open up the drop dropdown, um, we're gonna see the first two tags we'll see is T head and T body. This T head tag here uh, holds groups of headings. As we can see, it highlights week, topic, and reading assignment. And then the T body tag holds the rest of the content. And the one thing to note about these tags is that they are actually optional tags. Um, it would also be perfectly fine to just have the table row and the rest of the uh, table row headers directly beneath, beneath the, um, the table tag. However, adding in this T head and T body just makes it more obvious where all the headers and all of the uh, other content is within this table. And then the table rows, TR represents table row and it just shows each row of table data cells. And then going one step further, if we open up each table row, we'll either see TH or TD, TH representing table header and TD representing table data cell. And those just show uh, individual table cells within the um, overall table. So now that we have a better idea of um, how the tags are represented in tables, I'm gonna go ahead and find the table editor to determine the, uh, how complex this table is. So to uh, access the table editor, we go to the accessibility tools in Acrobat and we can click on it. And we would need to go to the reading order option. We can click on this. Um, when you first open the uh, reading order, the table editor actually won't be activated. We'll have to first select one of the tags. So I'm just gonna click on this one here. And now we can click on table editor. And as we can see, this table is 
pretty well represented by the table editor as it's a less complex table. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use the table editor to start with these column headings here, week, topic, and reading assignment. If I click on week, I can right click and click on table sub properties. And this will open up that menu that will allow us to define the scope as well as the spans. Um, if we click on the scope to be a column, this will define a week as a column header. And the row span and the column span by default is set to one. So I'll just leave this as one because as we can see in the table, week only spans one column and one row. And then we can just click OK. And this um, column header will have been uh, remediated correctly. And the nice thing about the table editor is that we can actually edit multiple um, column headers at a time if we know that the scope and the span will be the exact same thing. So I, I could just click on topic and then I can shift click reading assignment and that will select both column headers. And if we right click and click table cell properties, I can edit the scope and the span for both of these cells at the same time. So again, I'll just change scope to column and I'll leave row span and column span by default to one because each of these column headers only spans one row and one column. And I'll click okay. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is define weeks one through seven as row headers. And again, I'm just gonna shift click all of them to select all of them because I know that the scope and the span is gonna be the same for each of these row headers. And right click and click table cell properties. But this time the scope I'm going to define as row because I want each of these weak headers to be defined as row headers. And then again, I'll leave the default um, row span to one and column span to one and click OK. And then the next thing I'm going to do is check for those extra tags within each table cell. Um, first, I'm going to close the table editor by clicking reading order and then the X in the top right. If I open up this first cell here, we'll see there's a paragraph tag here. And if you open that paragraph, we'll see the actual content of week, which is highlighted here. We don't need this paragraph tag. We want the content to be directly beneath the table header as we don't want the content to be represented by a week within a paragraph within the table data cell. We just want the content to be directly beneath the table data cell here. So we can just delete that paragraph tag. And unfortunately, we'll need to do this for every single uh, table cell within the table, whether that be a table header or a table data, uh, data cell here as well. But um, for time's sake, I, um, I'm gonna move on to the next example I have down here. But um, uh, just a note that we would need to do that for each table row and going through each uh, table data cell to make sure that we remove those extra paragraph tags. I'll close this table here, and I'm going to go ahead and go into this next grade table. And just visually looking at it, um, we can see that it's a more complex table. If I open the table editor by going to reading order, and then again, clicking any of the tags to activate the table editor, and selecting table editor, a lot of the cells are actually represented okay, but as you can see on the left here, the homework column header here is a little bit malformed. As you can see, it's separated into two different cells here. So um, that's pretty much telling me that it's time to use the edit attribute object function. So I'm gonna close the uh, table editor and I'm gonna go ahead and find this cell within the table tags here. So I'll open the drop down and then I'll open the table header, uh, T head drop down and try to find that within the first table row. And as you can see, the, this table header cell holds the homework column header. And to open the edit attribute object function, we need to right click on this tag and go to properties. And then the edit attribute object function can be found in the middle at the bottom of this uh, drop down for object properties. And we click on edit attribute objects and the first thing we'll need to do is define a new item. And this will allow us to create a new attribute object. Um, essentially what we're doing is we're adding attributes 
to this column header here. And if we open up the dropdown for add, uh, attribute object one, um, Acrobat will by default think we're editing the layout of this column header. But we need to make sure we change layout to table because we want Acrobat to know that we're trying to edit a table object rather than a, a layout. Then the next thing I'm going to do is uh, manually define the scope for this column header. So again, I'll click attribute object one and then new item. And we'll be offered this menu for adding a key and value pair. The edit attribute fun function is very similar in how a dictionary works, where we have words mapped to definitions and the key being the word and the value being the definition. In terms of defining the scope, the key would be just scope and the value in terms of this case would be column. And this would define homework as a column header here. And value type, we can just leave as name. And the next thing I'm gonna do is define the column span for homework. And then again, clicking attribute object one, new item. This time, instead of scope, I'm gonna put call span as that's the key that needs to be used to find a column span. In the value, I'm just gonna put one as homework only spans one column. But this time the value type will need to be changed to integer because one is an integer. And then we can click okay. The last thing that needs to be done is to edit the row span of the homework header. As we can see that this uh, header here is span two rows. So clicking on attribute object and then new item again. Instead of call span, this time it will be row span and the value will be two because the header spans over two rows. And then again, changing value type to two for the integer value. And then clicking OK. That then we can click OK again to close the menu and then close the object properties. And just to show how the structure of the table has already changed, I'm going to just show it in the table editor again clicking reading order, and then clicking one of these tags in table editor. As you can see now, this homework header here does not split into two different cells, and it's just one cell that spans one column and two rows. But the next thing I'm going to do now is edit the next headers in that first row, so exams and projects. And again, I'm going to show um, uh, remediating these headers within the edit attribute objects. So the first thing to do is to select the exams column header, right click, properties, and then click on edit attribute objects. Then the first thing to do is click new item to create a new uh, attribute object and open this dropdown and make sure to change layout to table because you want Acrobat to know we're editing a table object rather than a layout and then click okay. And then we're going to define a new item again for the scope. So you can put the key as scope and the value as column. And this will define exams as a column header. And then click OK. And then the last thing to do is define the column span. So we'll have to create a new item again. And this time the key will be call span to a value of three as exam spans over one, two, and final, and changing the value type to integer. And that will be all we need to do for that column header. And then click OK and close. And then we're going to do the exact same thing for projects where we go to properties, edit attribute objects, create a new item, change layout to table, then click on attribute object again and click new item and change scope and the value to column. This defines project as a column header. And then we're going to define the column span to just three and then an integer. And you can click okay to close up the menu. And then the last thing to do is just to, again, take out the extra paragraph tags. And then I'm gonna move into the next table row 
um, for the subheadings for one two final and one two final. Again, um, right clicking on the data cell, going to properties, edit attribute objects, create a new item, and open the drop down and change layout to table. And click new item. I'm going to first define the scope for one. And it's going to be a column heading. And then make a new item again for column span and make the value one as an integer because one only spans over one column. I'm going to click OK to close this. And then we're going to have to do the exact same thing for the next five column headers. So go to edit extra objects, um, create a new item, open the drop down, change layout to table because we're adding a table object. Then click on attribute object again to create a new item. This time the key will be scope because we're trying to define the scope first for this column header and then make the value column. And then the last thing for the column span is to use the key call span over one column and change value type to integer. And then we can click OK to close out the menu. And then we're going to do the exact same thing for final. Uh, open up edit attribute objects, create a new item, change layout to table, new item, and then change the scope to the column for a column header, and then change the column span to just one of an integer. And click OK and close out the menu again. And then we'll have to do the same thing for the next column header for one. Go to edit attribute objects, create a new item, open the drop down, change layout to table because we're editing a table object rather than a layout. Click again on attribute one, new item, and we're going to find the scope to be a column scope. Click OK. Then the column span, we're going to define that to be just one and an integer. And then we can close that out. And then for two, we're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to edit attribute objects, new item, change layout to table, and create a new item for the scope. It's going to be a column scope. And then do that again for the column span of one integer and click OK, close that. And then for the last cell for final, we're going to do the exact same thing again, where you create a new item, open the drop down, and change the object to table. And then define the scope to be column. And lastly, define the call span to be just one. And click OK, and we can close that out. And then looking at the tags pane here, we can see that. The, each of these cells is still defined as a table data cell. What we need to do is just change TD to TH, and we can do that by just double clicking and changing the D to H, and this will just change it to a table header rather than a table data cell. And I'm going to go ahead and do that for each of these cells. And then the last thing to do is just get rid of this extra table header here because it's um, unused by any of the content within the table. And then again, going through each of these tags and taking out that extra paragraph tag too would also be necessary. But I have one more example, so I'm going to go ahead and move into that. Um, but first, if we check the um, accessibility checker, um, we can see that the tables do account for each of the accessibility checks for the uh, table accessibility checks. But moving on to the last example I have here. It's uh, this coffee table here. And it's uh, in a way similar to the last table that I was showing, um, where it's a generally a pretty complex table. And just to prove this point, if we open up the table editor, which can be found in the accessibility tools under reading order, and then just click on any of the tags to activate the table editor. Some of the table cells are represented quite well by the table editor. Whereas the row header here for Arabica definitely cannot be uh, represented in any way by this table editor. So this would tell us that we need to use the edit attribute object function. So I'm going to close the table editor by clicking read in order and clicking on the X to exit out of the table editor. 
And I'm just going to go ahead and go through each of the rows from top to bottom for each of the headers. So I'll first try to find that copy header in its first table row here. And then I'll right click on the tag, go to properties, and go to edit attribute objects. And um, if we're lucky, Acrobat will actually have already defined a attribute object for us, which we can see here. And all we need to do is just change that column span to five. Because as we can see, columns, uh, this first col column here for copy stands over one, two, three, four, five columns. If we click OK, and then the last thing we need to do is define the scope. So again, clicking on attribute object one and then new item. And we can just type in scope as the key and then value of column because it's a column header and click OK. And that's all we need to do for that first heading. Then going into the next row, this row is a little bit more complex. Um, as you can see, there's actually a placeholder cell here that spans over this row header for Arabica, as well as this for, uh, second row uh, column here. And the way to um, remediate this placeholder cell, um, we first open up the edit attribute objects function and Instead of spanning over one column, we would change the one to two so that the Acrobat knows that this placeholder cell will span over both Arabica and this second column here. And the last thing I would do is just make sure that the scope is defined and click OK, and then we can close out that attribute object. And then I'm going to go and edit origin type and notes as well. Uh, going to the edit attribute objects again, clicking new item, and again, changing layout to table, just so we ensure that Acrobat knows we're editing a table object rather than a layout. Then clicking on new item to define the scope to column, and then to define the column scan, click new item again, and the key this time is call span, and just a value of one integer, and then we can close out the attributes for that column header. And then for type, we're going to do the exact same thing. Click a new item, open the drop down, change layout to table, click attribute object, uh, click new item, and define the key as scope and the value as column, and click OK. And then to define the column span, new item again, this time the key will be call span, so a value of one integer. And then we can close that again. And lastly, for notes, um, we'll do the exact same thing. We we'll define a new attribute object, open the drop down, and change layout to table. Then again, click attribute object, new item to define the scope of column. And lastly, to define the call span, you click new item, call span of one integer, and you click OK, and click OK again to close out all of those menus. And then we can just take out the extra tags again. And then we'll be able to move on to the next row for the Arabica row header. So you can see it's the content for Arabica is hold in this table data cell here. So you just right click, go to properties and edit attribute objects, and then create a new item, change layout to table, and then I'm going to define the scope now. So I'm going to make a new item. The key is scope. But this time, the value will be row, as we want um, this cell to be represented as a row header. And I'll click OK. And now I'm going to define the row span by clicking on attribute object and clicking new item. And the key will be row span, um, rather than the call span that we've been using um, for a lot of the other headers, and then I'll change the value to be oh, however many um, rows that this header stands over. So it goes for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we just put a value of 10 here and change value type to integer. And that's all we need to do for that row header. And then making sure that we change this table data cell from TD to TH so that Acrobat knows that this is a table header. And again, taking out the extra 
um, tags here so that the content is directly beneath the table header here. And we need to do that for each of the table data cells in every single row. But the we'd have to go through each row here and do the exact same process. But for time's sake, I'm gonna show one last example for the uh, row header on the second page here. For this uh, row header here, we would need to find this header within one of the table rows. Um, it's in this one here. You can just open up the drop down, click on the first table data cell, right click, go to your properties, and go to edit attribute objects, create a new item, open up the drop down, change layout to your table, again, click on attribute object, new item. And again, we're going to define the scope first to be a row scope as you want. Um, this header to be defined as a row header, click OK. And lastly, defining the row span. So we're going to use the key of row span. And then we're going to um, make the value five because um, this row header stands over five rows. We'll click um, integer and OK to close the menu. And we won't need to redefine the column headers because we'll be using the exact same column headers that are used on the first page of this document. And then lastly, just changing TD to TH and taking out the extra content. And if we press the accessibility check, we'll see that we do pass all of the table um, accessibility checks. However, one thing to note is that the accessibility checker in Acrobat does not check for those extra paragraph tags. So that will have to be a manual check. But that is what I have for the demo. So I'm going to stop sharing here. Thank you so much, Andrew, for that. That's a, a great example of how challenging, <clears throat> excuse me, how challenging it is to remediate documents, especially when they have a more complex elements such as tables. Um, so I wanted to, we've got some time left, so I wanted to address some questions that we have um, in the chat. Um, so Amy asks, uh, when you run the accessibility checker and a warning shows up to check a simple table, is that just a warning to make sure that the table navigation is correct? Or is it a definitive indication that something is wrong with the table? I've interpreted it as the former, but wanted to double check. So that's a great question. Um, so the accessibility checker in Office 365 uh, usually places um, things in three different categories errors, warnings, and tips. So um, if there's anything in the error category, that is going to potentially break um, the accessibility of the document and, and somebody who's using assistive technology might have a, a, an issue, a particular issue with um, moving forward if there's an, an error. Um, for, for tables with merge cells, um, that's considered a warning. So it's not necessarily going to break the accessibility of that uh, the document with that table in there, um, but it is it's definitely going to cause some issues. So as I mentioned earlier, when someone's using JAWS um, to uh, to navigate a document and they enter into a more complex table, it will announce right away that this is a non-uniform table. Um, so that kind of reinforces that, that error, or the warning rather. So it, it doesn't necessarily break it, but it's going to make it definitely more challenging for somebody who uses assistive technology to, um, to interact with more complex items under the warning category. Well, hopefully that answered that question. Um, and then another question we have, will the columns be le read left to right? So I'm assuming this is um, during the example where I showed simplifying um, more complex tables in Microsoft Word. The last item I showed was um, uh, uh, homework exams and projects in three columns rather than in a table. And it, it is what, what I've actually done is I've linear, linearized that and um, just turned it into a three column um, uh, 
linear text. And so, yes, it will, it will effectively read it from left to right, but really what it's doing is reading from top to bottom. I've just reorganized the flow to be into three columns instead of um, from top to bottom. So it's just a, a, a reflow of that particular, of that, that particular text. So it, it will read it in that, that accurate order. Then Susan says, we have users that request tables for accessibility with reading comprehension. Is there a way to have tables be skipped over by screen readers? If so, then we could maybe include the information in both columns and table. Any advice on accommodating multiple needs? Um, I don't know that there's a way to, to turn off tables being um, uh, recognized by screen readers. I don't think that there is, and screen reader users can, can choose to not enter a table. They can skip the table if they want to. Um, so if you wanted to present the information in, in two different ways, either columns or headings, um, you might want to let your students know that the same information is presented twice, um, and then they can have the option to skip the table and then just read it in, in, uh, in, in a column if, if that is their particular preference. Um, let's see, and then Terrell asks, how do you know what keys and values are allowed for PDF attribute objects? Do you have a reference guide that you consult for all of these details? Um, Andrew, did you want to answer that one? Um, sure. Um, I'm pretty sure there are references or guides out there, but for the keys and values that I know, it's just um, the ones that I showed in the demo, which scope as well as the column span or row span ones. And then for the values, um, just however many rows the column or the row header spans over. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure there, there would be some references out there, but as far as I know, it's just, those are the two keys that I know that are used uh, primarily for tables. Okay, great. I actually, um, I put a link in the chat. Uh, this is a link to the PDF Association um, and it is uh, a link to their TAG PDF Best Practices Syntax Guide, um, and it does have all of the, the information in there um, as far as, as values and um, keys for, for, for those particular items for that, uh, uh, for that attribute. So it should have more information in there if folks are interested in that. Um, and then uh, Terrell has a very good comment. This extraordinary, the extraordinary complexity of this process is why we strongly encourage folks to use HTML whenever possible. Um, so yeah, so you guys got a, a real live view of the complexity and the time it takes to remediate, um, you know, tables that weren't really that completely complicated, but there's a lot of steps that need to happen in order for the information to be announced um, accurately. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work that uh, needs to be done there. Lori says, uh, does what you just showed us impact reading with the keyboard tabbing? Um, so it, it shouldn't. I'm assuming, Lori, you're, you're referring to using tab in PDF if you're trying to um, uh, navigate in a PDF document or, or a table. Okay, yeah, so the answer, yeah. So it should not affect the, the tab order. Um, it's, it's primarily just to associate uh, for screen readers, um, different row and different column headers. So when the information, the data is, in, uh, is announced, it will be announced with the correct context um, with the row header and uh, with the column header and row header if, uh, if it has a, a, a row header associated with it. Um, and then Joe says, if HTML is strongly rec recommended, are you suggesting that most things be web pages and not Word docs or PDF? Yes, that, that's what we are recommending. That is what we are suggesting. If you can present the information um, in HTML, um, it's far more accessible and um, easier to, uh, to navigate a HTML web page than it is a Word document or PDF. Um, as you know, kind of shown throughout this afternoon, there are a lot of inconsistencies with how JAWS um, announces 
uh, content in Word um, and PowerPoint and PDF. Um, and every time there's an update, um, you know, it, it kind of changes the behavior of JAWS. And so we kind of have to reevaluate, you know, what, what is happening, what is the behavior that we're seeing. Um, and, um, you know, is this something um, that we need to make note of. So uh, those kinds of, of inconsistencies and, and challenges aren't as evident in HTML as, as we see in electronic documents. Okay, so we are right at four o'clock um, and the end of Global Accessibility Awareness Day. So I wanna thank everybody for uh, sticking around. And if you stayed for all of our sessions today, um, congratulations, that's that's quite a, a marathon for, for everybody. So uh, thanks again for everybody to, who showed up today. And again, uh, this information will be posted on our, on our website, um, hopefully fairly soon. And join us again next year for Global Accessibility Awareness Day 2023. Thanks, everyone.